Dr. Ranjit Ghosh. Dr. Ranjit Ghosh will be the chairperson and he will take up the section entitled Ethics and Social Philosophy. We have uh, 20 papers to do, 20 papers are there on the list and uh, the time allotted is up to one, but uh, because we are running late by 15 minutes, he can go up to 1.15. Over to Professor Ghosh. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Das. Yesterday late evening, I was uh, 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 delegated this karma to perform uh, uh, <laughs> the and chairing the uh, session ethics and social philosophy. So uh, at the beginning, at the very outset, I want to make two things clear that since there are 20 papers, we can give 10 minutes to each paper. Maximum. And a maximum and those 10 minutes five minutes will be uh, the paper reading and another five minutes for discussion and another thing the paper readers should uh, note the uh, the the questions raised by different uh, the participants and they should try to incorporate these questions in their uh, papers when they want that their papers are going to be published. So they should be very careful about incorporating the questions and answering the questions which are raised in the uh, in this platform because all these questions cannot be discussed in this platform. So that is one very important thing. And the five minutes for question we have kept and those those questions will be raised by the people here, the participants and the either the paper reader will answer it or uh, if any necessary, uh, uh, if, if it is feel, felt necessitated, then I will intervene. So I don't want to intervene because of the time constraint. So the, let us very straight up start with the first paper. And, and the first paper is uh, uh, Dr. Kolas Chandra Maharana's paper, and that is uh, on uh, Indian theory of values. So I now request Dr. Kolas Maharana to... Uh, uh, sir, Kolas, Kolas, uh, Kolas Chandra Maharana is not available now. Right. So the, uh, then Lakhan, uh, Dr. Lakhan Patra should say who is coming next. Miss Rabani Alpana, Miss Rabani Alpana, The Ethics of Human Cloning. Ethics of Human Cloning. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is one of the very important uh, uh, paper uh, in the applied philosophy in the biomedical ethics and let us start here from her. Srabani Alpana is at Bajirauth Memorial College lecturer. Sir, Namaskar. Good evening to all. Sir, uh, is it my turn to start the presentation, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is 11.45 now. You start your paper. For five, you are given five minutes and if possible, you if the synopsis is read there, you read the synopsis and the important points made. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, sir. I'll just take uh, five minutes to start this. Sir, thank you. Uh, respected uh, my teachers, respected uh, members of AOPA, and all my fellow colleagues, and uh, whoever is present here, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, uh, present this paper. I have recently uh, done the uh, recently completed my doctorate uh, degree on this topic of human cloning. And uh, uh, this time I'm presenting this topic as the groundwork, the ethics of human cloning and the groundwork. When I started researching, I found it very, <clears throat> most of the things are not mixed and it, uh, I found it divided. Some papers say only to study about the ethicality and some other papers uh, presented the different philosophers and their views. Then some other papers, even though philosophical, but some other papers then started about the uh, uh, scientific methods that it has involved. So here I am working it, uh, I am presenting it as a groundwork so that everyone can know what is this concept is all about. Where uh, does the cloning concept came from? And then uh, what is the definition? And this is very much important to know the meaning of human cloning first. And then obviously there are uh, pros and cons. And there are two sides of human cloning that you find 
Yes, sir. Hello. Sir, uh, uh, am I interrupting? Can I carry on? No, no, no. You continue, continue. No yes, problem. Sir, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I would like to. With human cloning, understanding the concept is very much important. For example, we all have the idea that human cloning uh, is making replicas of the exact human being who is the donor, or the first one who is uh, want to have a clone. No, human cloning has kind. And before we jump to the cloning, we first know where the idea first came from. Uh, scientists first use the cloning concept as making replicas of trees from a uh, cultural uh, field, then it jumped to the animal field. Uh, but J. Weber was the first one who coined the term. It was for meaning for the trees only, for the plant kingdom. But then it jumped to the animal uh, part. And then human cloning first started with Ian Ilmert by scientist Ian Ilmert, who uh, cloned. Uh, Dolly, the first mammal to be cloned by uh, uh, scientific nuclear uh, pro procedure. But uh, then India also, in 1960s, India also for cloned a first buffalo of in our in, uh, world history, the first buffalo to be cloned, whose name was Samrupa. With each animal cloning, the uh, human cloning concept started getting uh, controversial that, that in the next 50 years, and in the next 10 years, our world is going to see the human cloning concept. So what exactly is human cloning concept? Human cloning concept is definite, uh, arrived with its, three, uh, with its three different kind. They are, first is reproductive human cloning, where exactly we create an embryo and then it is uh, implanted in a surrogate mother to take the uh, to uh, to for the embryo to take birth naturally as a natural process but there are other two kinds which are therapeutic cloning it is a therapy that's why it is so called name therapeutic cloning is when we will use a clonal embryo that embryo will not be implanted rather it will be used to further generate stem cells now what are stem cells we have uh, so many kinds of cells in our bodies but stem cell is such kind of cell which has miraculous power to regenerate itself, also to create other cells like liver cells, heart cells, uh, uh, other cells that, that is required. So this is the power of uh, stem cells by which we can create the cells and by the cell we can create the organ we need. And that is how it can be useful in case of organ transplantation or in many other fields. So cloning method, by cloning, it refers to create a copy of something. So human cloning is not always creating a copy of full formed human, but it is to make copy of DNA or human cells or tissues and creating any kind of human cells or tissues is also called human cloning. So whether it be creating cells or tissues or organs or an organism, everything fall under the definition of human cloning. But before we jump to the human cloning concept, there are some areas for any researcher to have the focus and they are important fields like origin of the idea of human cloning, then proper definition of human cloning, then what are the issues involved with human cloning, then understanding the different kinds of human cloning, then ethical theories and their perspective towards human cloning, then what are the religious views, uh, then pros and cons with human cloning, different philosophers and their views on human cloning, countries and their laws for accepting or rejecting cloning, then our leading uh, foundations or institutes that are currently working on human cloning. So these areas are important uh, to be investigated before we jump uh, to discuss about human cloning concept. <clears throat> so after that, there are... <clears throat> After uh, then comes the third uh, part, the uh, three kinds. There are another is DNA cloning. It is the replica. It is to make the replica of DNA. Hello, hello. Uh, you are only having two more minutes. Uh, 
just okay, uh, uh, just give us uh, whether it is ethical or not this sir uh, consequentialism deontological theory of kant and virtue ethics are uh, have some mixed views that are important while uh, discussing the uh, human cloning concept while uh, consequentialism is founded uh, founded on the idea that action is evolved in terms of pleasure and pain following the consequences and if it promotes the happiness in a larger amount then following this concept those who the, the group who will agree with human cloning they might support it, this idea uh, connected to this theory but that does not mean it is ethical then comes the deontological theory or deontology theory uh, the perspective is also mixed and divided modern deontological uh, followers says that where we are accepting that even uh, every animal uh, some say that uh, so something which is subject to life has an interesting value, not instrumental value. So point, uh, pointing out that point, some will say that even the grown human being is also has some moral status and thereby it is ethical. And then some will say only therapeutic cloning is ethical by which we can treat disease, not the human cloning concept. And then virtue ethics comes and the virtue ethics has to ask some questions that uh, does human cloning present any benefits to our society like every action? Does human cloning aim at some good? Does human cloning, uh, dishonest use, use of human cloning would provide no edumonia for society? But would the honest use will bring some edumonia for society? We might answer the, uh, we might answer positively or negatively, but one cannot deny the fact that each side have their own rational thoughts and solid reasons either to accept or deny the concept. Like uh, in the words of Matthew Lipman, I will jump to the conclusion. In philosophy, a teacher is not looking for terminal answers like a terminal illness. A terminal answer gives you no options. A good answer is instead like a candle in the dark. It provides both light and mystery. It should of course illuminate while at the same time reveal the contours of the unknown that there are much more to be investigated and learned. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Now uh, uh, the, we expect some questions from the house and uh, if possible you can answer them. Yes sir. Lakuna, is there any question in the chat box? No, sir. No, no. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Is not cloning uh, on ethical uh, being uh, anti nature? Uh. Uh, sir, uh, can I repeat is the question? Not, is not cloning on ethical being anti nature? Uh, yes, sir. There are various uh, uh, perspectives towards this cloning that some say it is uh, ethical, unethical, being unnatural to our society. But uh, supporters who have accepted cloning, there are actually multiple uh, issues like uh, is, uh, it, it does steal our individuality and etc. But yes, one more is that it is unnatural. But sir, supporters, like I said, with every pros and cons, there are two sides of the, this theory, of this concept. Supporters who have accepted human cloning as a possibility in our future, they have said, asexual reproduction is not new in our world. It is not artificial always. There are two kinds of asexual reproductions in our world. One is uh, artificial, which we will create by IVF and etc. And another is also uh, natural. In some uh, vertebrates and invertebrates, like some fishes, reptiles, our sexu sexual reproduction is always uh, present by nature. Nature has made them uh, by that. Our sexual uh, reproduction is al already happening by nature. It occurs in some vertebrates and invertebrates. But we have to follow biology and for that, and in this process is also called parthenogenesis. If we study that, and I have also given my, in my paper, the, uh, the in my footnotes, that uh, scientific fields that uh, that says that talks about that parthenogenesis is also is a kind of natural asexual reproduction that is already happening in our world. 
so no it is not that uh, natural and again according to g more who has already said that we will commit a naturalistic fallacy by if we will commit that that everything is natural that is not ethical and everything that is unnatural is not unethical like uh, if we are having rain and tornadoes or uh, tsunamis this is natural doesn't mean that those are ethical those are possible harms and if we do something to save ourselves by artificial uh, technology by using some artificial technology so this is not uh, unethical this is uh, quite all right to accept so the thing is if we are in my point of view obviously there are two sides which are important but uh, we do not need to ban the cloning on terms of individuality naturality or the things that uh, can be debated over rather we should ban it if there are possible harms because that is the only thing by which we are not inflating pain in our society we are trying to benefit our society so uh, thank you thank you that that thank you uh, only Sra one Sra one Sravani, question i want to Sravani, ask that you got your uh, from which university sir you got your phd from which university ravensai university or even sir who oh, oh, guide guide sir himachal sekhar samad sir okay thank you one one last question hello uh, yes. you 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 uh, uh, talked about surrogacy uh, how do you, uh, the, which variety of surrogacy you will opt for cloning uh, sir and definitely altruistic surrogacy sir uh, surrogacy has some kinds like commercial surrogacy is already banned but there is another which is altruistic uh, surrogacy whereby the surrogate mother is not under any kind of pressure and the only intention is to provide a child to the infertility couple so only that situation it is uh, acceptable thank you thank you for the paper thank, thank you sir thank you sir next paper please our next paper is by uh, mathura okay. alla understanding of is and ought in urgency and perspective mathura alda is a lecturer in josipur college josipur mayurbhanj yes sir namaskar sir ah, sir please and please continue with your paper yes sir esteemed chairperson of this session and respected teachers grand teachers and all the members of the aopa association and my paper is as i said understanding of each and ought in urgentian perspective each stands for what is the case or the fact whereas ought stand for what ought to be the case or value or normativity philosophers differs with regard to the nature of fact and value and the relationship between two by reflecting upon the nature of values we have absolutism as well as relativism views but in urgentian's philosophy there is an interesting interface between them in the earlier work tractatus logico philosophicus he subscribes for more whereas in the later work philosophical investigations he is in favor of a later view in the tractatus he takes rich logical discourse as the paradigm the logic of language has been taken as the means to resolve philosophical problems in terms of clarity of expression logic plays a pivotal role in resolving such philosophical problems by logical clarity in language discourse his observations on the notion of metaphysics ethics logic aesthetics and religion are more profound than the notion of factual relativism he holds that the ethical values are beyond the ambit of the factual and ideas to trans empirical domain that defies the logic of the factual this means that urgentian is on the track of ethical absolutism that was exposed in his earlier work by stating that values are beyond physical reality whereas realities of the world are relative facts on the other hand in later work urgentian 
holds that language is used not only to describe facts but also for manifold purposes which make room for alternative discourses having the logic of their own there are different contexts to learn the language in so far as language becomes context specific in the tractatus these two highlighted views are what is the case or fact and what ought to be the case these are well understood distinctively and clearly what ought to be is study of ethics and the study of metaphysical subject matter whereas what is the case is matter of factual constituents that is the world which is described by language the language is meaningful when it explains the existing case in the case of ethics language does not play any role to explain in meaningful if language tries to do so language becomes meaningless or nonsense that is meaningless and logic of language is misunderstood so the language cannot articulate ethics meaningfully for urgenstein ethics is higher in nature so far as we cannot have it at empirical hand urgenstein states if there is any value that does have value it must lie outside the whole sphere of what happens and is the case now on letter against things <coughs> in philosophical investigation especially urgenstein developed the huge view theory of meaning he states that for a large class of classes cases true not for all in which we employ the word meaning it can be explained thus the meaning of a word is its use in the language so he holds that language is used not only to describe facts but also for manifold purposes which makes room for alternative discourse having the logic their own language is context bound even the notion of objectivity needs to be revisited in order to see if the so called fact is value neutral in the light of letter of genstein concerning the nature of value urgenstein would argue that value for c are relative and the notion of absolute value is a misnomer as is reality so is language and it's also ethics that is reality determines the nature of language and the nature of ethics the meaning of language is how it is used in a different context since values are intelligible only in the domain of human actions it is the perspectives and contexts that determine the moral worth of an action my concluding remarks the fact that the notion of value is ontology specific h is the world view so is the value for it again in the fact tractatus world is constituted as the totality of positive and negative facts as the moral discourse cannot be analyzed in terms of empirical discourse it falls beyond the domain of empirical this lends rationality to the idea that moral issues are non empirical or transcendental but in the philosophical investigation urgenstein subscribes to ethical relativism because of his idealistic learning according to whose there are alternative ways of understanding and encountering the world there is nothing as fact as such it is the perspectives that determine how one perceives or interprets the facts and events that constitute the world this epistemic relativism entails ethical relativism since values are context specific can one can hardly distinguish between a set of values from the this values though the odd issues are parasitic on each signifying the facticity of context 
the odd statements turn out to be relative depending not only on the consideration of context but also on the purposes concerns and circumstances at hand fact remains that cardinal values are absolute whereas the customary values are relative or contingent the letter derives its meaning from the former in the sense the fixed value fact value the dichotomy doesn't hold a water the notion of pure objectivity is <coughs> sorry the notion of pure objectivity in respect of value remains a misnomer so ethics in context ethics is context bound in so far as relativism and pure objectivity with regard to ethics remains a misnomer thank you Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mathuralda, uh, now one thing uh, the, uh, you just uh, tell us that uh, whether Wittgenstein believes in this that art can be derived from is or is it is not. Yes, sir. Art can be derived from is. Sorry. Hello. Uh, that means he is uh, in support of Murian uh, version. Moore's version, or whose version he is propounding, that or or will, will be derived from his. This is your contention regarding Wittgenstein. Yes, sir. I am. So, whom he is following in this uh, contending on this issue? Moore or somebody else? Sir, I think sir more. Okay, the floor is open for discussion for five minutes. Yeah, I uh, I would like to say something here. Yes, sir. Uh, Ranjit sir, may I speak here? Hello. Sure, sure, sure. Please. Uh, I uh, I don't know how how Mathura is talking about uh, is can be uh, art can be derived from is uh, from Wittgenstein perspective. Sorry, uh, sorry, sir. In... sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Art can be derived from uh, sorry. It can be derived from art, sir. No, no, no. Uh, this this is more yeah. because. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen. Uh, okay. In Tractatus, at least. He has he is silent about uh, this question. I mean, not even silent. I mean, in the sense, he has not spoken uh, this right. the way you have put it. In Tractatus, he is more concerned about ease. Okay, and Sir. he said any question regarding to art, we should pass out with the in silence. Remember that seventh statement he has made. Last one. Yes. Last sir. one. Yeah. Yes. So he is referring to. Uh, all those uh, questions which cannot be uh, represented as uh, answered can cannot be answered in a propositional form like true or false uh, attributes cannot be ascribed to them. So, so these questions of religious religious beliefs or statements or ethical beliefs or statements uh, or any other you know spiritual or in any other kind which is not empirical in nature, we should keep. A silence. Uh, we should but that uh, apart, know, but that apart, be silent but that about apart, all those questions. But uh, that apart, so, Wittgenstein has a very important statement in this regard. Wittgenstein says that ethics is a condition of the world as logic is. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I, yes, I have, sir. So you should have taken that into account and explained uh, what it is. Yes, sir. I will develop through all this. Thank you, sir. There is a question in the chat box. The question is, if values are relative, then there would be no absolute value. Do you mean to say this? And there is another, uh, this, this, this only question is there. If no, values sir. are relative, then there would be no absolute value. Do you mean to say this? No, sir. 
uh, exactly i do, do not say that the uh, uh, if there is relative val uh, values then there would not be absolute value i said that there is uh, some kind of relations rela relations because <coughs> when we are saying that the values are relative automatically we also uh uh, uh assume or um, subscribe the uh, values which are uh, uh stated as the absolute but relative in the sense when we uh, determine it in our uh, actions and daily activities of life that's it ये गुड़ा सब निजे कहले हो बने उडगन साइन कोसु बा कर दरकार माने उडगन साइन कोसु कथर फॉलो करतवा दरकार राइट सर सर तो वेदर वेदर दिस डिस्कशन ऑफ इज एंड आउट इज एन इंपोर्टेंट डिस्कशन इन उडगन साइंस फिलोसफी लाइक दैट ऑफ मूव वी हैव टू फर्स्ट चेक यू जस्ट थिंक ओवर दिस फर्दर एंड देन यू ट्राई टू प्रिपेयर एंड डेवलप योर पेपर अकॉर्डिंगली थैंक यू थैंक यू so we can go to the next one the next Thank presenter you. is sachin kumar babu an analysis of sankara view of liberation he is at national college nuwapada as a lecturer but 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 uh, sachin you have been asking Hello. questions to all the participants but your title is very confusing sankara view means uh, uh, adulterated view or what sankara's view it should be हेलो एनीवे सर नमस्कार सर नमस्कार आई एम ऑडिबल सर एम आई ऑडिबल हाउ यू आर ऑडिबल यस सर नमस्कार गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल रेस्पेक्टेड ऑल माय टीचर्स एस्टीम चेयरपर्सन चेयरपर्सन ऑफ दिस सिंपोजियम प्रोफेसर रंजीत घोष सर ग्रीटिंग टू माय को प्रेजेंटर्स Uh, and all my beloved uh, lover of uh, philosophy family uh, first of all i am uh, very much thankful to the team aopa for uh, giving me the golden opportunity to present uh, a paper having a, a title that is uh, an exploration or an analysis of sankara's uh, point of view of liberation uh, in advaita vedat philosophy uh, that i am going to present mm. And that uh, let I am going to talk about uh, the Sankara's view. Uh, Indian philosophy plays a significant role in the sphere of uh, world philosophy. Astika and Nastika is the two main aspects of Indian philosophy. Advaita Vedanta is included in Astika Darshan. It based on Vedic grounds. Advaita or Monism are referred as one and same realities. Sankara Charya is the chief exponent of Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta is one such school of Vedanta which tell us the ultimate reality is a single undivided reality if uh, if we determine the entire advaita philosophy of sankaracharya it consists with a shloka that is shloka dhina pravakhyami jaduktam grantha koti vi brahma satyam jagat mithya jivo brahmi va na parah that means brahman is the uh, only reality world is unreal and the individual soul is non different from brahman but the individual selves uh, that we are imagine uh, ourselves or themselves as different from brahman because they have a false knowledge about this reality the attainment of brahman is the ultimate goal of life or that is the saram banam of human life but uh, but such realization is not easy affair at all according to sankara liberation is the only pathway or the way to know the truth of this so called uh, unreal world uh, sankara says that it is on uh, attainable except by the good karmas of hundred of crores of human lives however it is uh, it is only human beings who can attain him since the universal self is present in every man the person the person who have no interest for the attainment of liberation or, or the self knowledge enters into dark region in this regard isa upanishad also says that 
असूर्य नामते लोक अंधे न तमस तास्ते प्रत्याभिगछते ये के चात्म हनो जना शंकराचार्य ट्राइस टू डिफाइन द वर्ल्ड इन द लाइट ऑफ इल्यूजन हिस कंसेप्शन अबाउट दिस वर्ल्ड इज दैट इज दैट द वर्ल्ड इज ए इज ए इज ए मेरे अपियरेंस ऑफ ब्राह्मण द वर्ल्ड हैज नो रियल एक्जिस्टेंस फ्रॉम द ट्रांसेंडेंटल पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू द वर्ल्ड हैज थ्री एस्पेक्ट ऑफ एक्जिस्टेंस फर्स्ट वन इज द प्रत्याभाषिक और द एपेरेंट second one is vyavaharika or that is practical and the last but not the least that is paramarthika or transcendental or absolute in this context i would like to mention that uh, sankaracharya does not deny the existence of world world is practically real no doubt but transcendentally it is unreal uh, we we found that this world is real in vyavaharika manner which is not actual because of ignorance we think this practical aspect of world is real knowledge of brahman leads us to the eternal bliss that is moksha or liberation then i will come to that point liberation is not a state of nothingness or void according to sankracharya liberation means the removal of ignorance by right knowledge when knowledge downs attains ignorance removes and the consequently all bondage gone one can achieve the liberation liberation thus means freedom from bondage it is a state of pure bliss it can be attained here in this life which is called jivana mukti that means sankracharya accept that uh, liberation is possible in this life that is jivana mukti advaita vad or sankracharya's views emphasize on the true knowledge of self and brahman true knowledge is direct immediate intuitive knowledge of non difference of individual self from the supreme self this is called liberation which is the primary aim of sankracharya it it is here to be noted that uh, advaita vedanta or sankracharya exhibits the importance of moral and religious means to attain the uh, ultimate end of uh, human life he puts forward the four fold kinds or the four fold means of liberation that is uh, called as uh, sadhana chatushtaya the sadhana chatushtaya is necessary for a man to become the worthy of studying the vedanta then uh, we shall discuss what are the four fold means of uh, uh, sadhana chatushtaya uh, first number 1 is nitya nitya vastu viveka that means nitya anitya vastu viveka one should have the knowledge of discrimination between eternal and non eternal or ephemeral the inquirer in the philo- philosophy of uh, vedanta should have the capacity to distinguish between the eternal and the ephemeral object as a necessary prerequisite prerequisites for his study second one is iha murtartha bhoga viraga that means detachment towards the worldly and the other worldly enjoyment the second condition required for the student of vedanta is detached from the all type of enjoyments as well as the desires for them both worldly as well as other worldly third one is samatmadi sadhana sambata that means sama dama along with the discrimination between eternal and ephemeral and detached from the enjoyment the inquirer should possess the means of sama dama shraddha sadhana upadhi and titiksha this means of uh, this means of sama is control the mind while dama means control of senses and no, shraddha so means to control in the scriptures conclude. yes sir the last one is mumukhyata and mumukhyata means the means have the presence of desires for the uh, for the uh, liberation <clears throat> and the sankracharya put emphasis on also the savana manana and nidhisadhana sankracharya put emphasis that brahmana liberation can be realized only through the knowledge or that brahman knowledge without knowledge nothing can be realized karma and devotion are also the path of uh, uh, for achieving liberation but according to shankara karma and devotion are regarded as subsidiary or secondary shankara acharya says that karma and devotion help us to know the reality they also helps in our purifying by mind but knowledge alone is able to dis- dis- destroy the ignorance so knowledge only we can achieve or we are on a, we are able to know the absolute this context uh, has been treated with a shloka that shankara acharya said that kurute ganga sagar gamanam व्रत पारिपल अथवा दान ज्ञान विहिने सर्वमन मुक्ति नवती सत जन्म दैट मीन्स 
one may go on pilgrimage observe the vows and give away wealth in charity yet devoid of the knowledge of self nothing can give freedom even in the hundreds of life i am com coming to the conclude, uh, concluding part that after the above analysis it can be said that all thing in this world is impermanent non eternal limited in space and time every person in this human society attracted with the uh, worldly objects and expresses their desire to achieve them that is why our mind can never be stable if we try to pass away the temporalisms of this world and and started to find out the way of absolute peace then the path is open in front of us advaita vedanta tell us how to cross the practical aspects of world and get the path of absolute freedom by acquiring knowledge of identity of brahman and jiva after receiving that uh, pure knowledge false knowledge about this world is removed and the path of liberation is expanded so that my message or the sankracharya's message that each person can reach the absolute peace transcending the temporal system of the world thank you sir thank you thank you, thank you, thank you. i have a very uh, single little question and then it will be uh, open to the floor uh, that uh, sure. when you are talking about jivan mukti uh, is it the sadeha mukti or videha mukti what sankaracharya is referring Uh, yes sir sankaracharya uh, if we analysis the uh, context of uh, liberation sankaracharya says that jivana mukti means uh, the liberation that is possible in this life and uh, in this life means that is body with the self that is sadeha mukti sir please see dr patra if other questions are there in the no, there is no question in the chat box uh, uh, dear president but i have two queries to sachin yes sir one is is sankaracharya motivating to create a society of monks and number two uh, is is sankaracharya advocating sadya mukti or krama mukti um, uh, uh, some, uh, yes sir uh, first uh, that uh, sankaracharya's uh, if we determination of upon the sankaracharya's view uh, uh, sankaracharya's uh, uh, according to his view that world is not uh, uh, unreal world is real from the view of a transcendental point of view or absolute point of view uh, but uh, in context of practical existence or absolute existence the world is uh, unreal that uh, uh, this also put with the notions that the uh, brahma satyam jagatam mithya Uh, that he 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 tries to determine the society, uh, or he tries to uh, uh, share the message about the people that uh, you you have to that perspective uh, from the practical point of view the world is on the earth, but but in the perspective of uh, uh, transcendental point of view or the absolute point of view the world is real, and also the sadhya mukti means the body uh, having the self, and also in the practical existence. Uh, or if you are live in this practical world sadeha mukti means that uh, mukti means the freedom or the that kind of position uh, where no man is not mu sadeha mukti pachari nahi sadya mukti all in a sudden instantly or it is um, gradually sadya uh, or krama that is it yes that is krama mukti sir that is gradually or the phase wise if we try yeah. to uh, meditate the four fold means or the shravana manana nidhi sadhana uh, that that are the phases of a of a person that uh, if a person uh, do this uh, this uh, levels of uh, meditations or the phases of meditation and that is called krama mukti or the uh, meditation of om also uh, sankracharya accepted through so om uh, by renouncing the om or the meditation of om also one can uh, becomes the liberation get the liberation thank you thank you sir thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you. sachin we can uh, proceed to the next paper thank you sir thank you thank you so much next paper is by anil kumar nahak he would speak on mohima cult and he is from uh, barampur university odisha he is a research scholar there anil Anil, I think he is not here. The next one, announce please. Ah, uh, next one is 
मिस्टर राधाश्याम मिश्र हिज पेपर इज द नीड ऑफ वर्चुअल फ्रेंडशिप फॉर ह्यूमन वेलबीइंग इन प्रेजेंट सोसाइटी हिज रिसर्च स्कॉलर फ्रॉम उत्कल यूनिवर्सिटी राधेश्याम हेलो हां हेलो यू आर अवेलेबल यस राजस्थान मिश्र प्लीज गिव डेलीवरेशन ऑन योर पेपर Yes, uh, thank you so much for uh, the members of AOPA and uh, respected chairperson of the session, and all the dignitaries across the state. I'm really lucky to have a chance to present my paper. So, <clears throat> my paper is called "The Need of Virtue Friendship for Human Well-being in the Contemporary Society." So, in a brief, I would like to talk about first human beings and our inner nature. we as human beings are uh, fond of companionship and as such we like to be accompanied by friends and family with those we feel connected and with those we can have a sense of life with all its positive uh, enhancement that life has to offer so as such friendship occupies a significant place in our lives and as such it is essential part of the good life and this being so it has been a significant part of the discussions of so many philosophers such as uh, the theory of moral conduct of smith and uh, the ethics of spinoza the citizen by hobbes and also locke's essay concerning human understanding it has been in discussion since so long and uh, this this gives us an idea how essential it is in our lives so at the beginning of my investigation investigating the nature of friendship and what friendship actually is i was directed towards aristotle because uh, he has given a systematic account of friendship in such a way that not only it it, it gives us a brief and uh, positive outlook upon what friendship is it also gives a systematic structure to his overall theory of state and uh, his entire philosophical system so as such aristotle firstly talks about human beings being social that the good life is always something that can be achieved in the social domain it cannot be achieved in the individual domain as we as humans are by nature social so in his two of his classic philosophical literature the nicomachean ethics and the eudemian ethics he has dedicated two of the 10 books that is the book 8 and book 9 of the nicomachean ethics and also one book of the uh, five books of eudemian ethics to the discussion of friendship so as such aristotle is considered as the champion of classification and his theory of friendship is no exception he has discussed friendship in a systematic division he has uh, divided the friendship into three categories and as such then goes on to develop his perfect form of friendship which in turn shades the other forms of friendship so before going to that i should talk about what friendship is in general first so by talking what friendship actually is in the literal sense i would like to talk about a definition the stanford encyclopedia of philosophy defines friendship as a distinctively personal relationship grounded in a concern on part of each friend for the welfare of the other for the other sake and it involves some degrees of intimacy so this is this is how the literal definition goes uh, and in this regard aristotle has made some special effort to define what friendship actually is so in this regard he writes to speak of friendship in the primary sense only is to do violence to facts and make one assort paradoxes but it is impossible for all sorts of friendships to come under a single definition so this shows the complexity of the varieties of relation that we as individuals involve in the society we simply cannot be put together in a single definition so as such he defines friendship not only as a virtue but also as an activity so as a virtue it is a significant part and parcel of the good life and as an activity it keeps us individuals engaged in the society so as such before going to the classification he has given some basic qualities some some general qualities that a friend should have so first he talks about 
the presence of reciprocal action and care and attention so the 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 presence of reciprocity and as well as mutual affection it also prevents us to be friends with inanimate objects so reciprocity is essential and mutual care and affection is definitely essential because without care and uh, affection we fail we fail to be with somebody because we as humans love to be nurtured we love we love to be comforted by someone else so as such he talks about friendship as it is only restricted to humans and and, and as friendship is a subject that is only restricted to humans and in that way it is also an ethical issue so firstly the main feature of friendship aristotle talks is that to have a friend uh, to have a friend is to have somebody to care for the other for the other sake that is the fundamental definition of friendship that aristotle has given then he has pointed this in his nicomachean ethics that wishing good for the other sake becomes essential as when we do wish good for somebody and we have some you know intention that is ultimately directed towards our own well being it is simply become selfish and ultimately it fails fails as um it, it fails as a process when we try to establish a friendship with somebody else so as such after that he goes on to develop the tripartite distinction of friendship so he talks about three kinds of friendship first there is a friendship of utility then there is a friendship of pleasure and lastly he goes on to develop his perfect friendship or uh, the friendship of the good so please i would like to talk about conclude conclude please yes sir. Uh, yes sir so i would like to talk about uh, the two forms of the, the the two lower forms of friendship as the friendship of utility and pleasure as belonging to the lower ground and as virtue friendship as belonging to something to the good to the general perfect friendship so the friendship of utility and pleasure are similar the friendship of utility is based on the fact that when we love somebody or uh, when we be friends with somebody with whom we can have some uh, useful work getting done so as long as we are getting our utility our friendship sustains and as long as the utility vanishes so does the friendship and when it comes to pleasure it is similar we are getting pleasure or satisfaction out of somebody and in that way we are bounded to that person in a friendship and as long as the pleasure vanishes so does the friendship but in these two forms of friendship i should consider the two as lower or accidental because in these two forms of friendship we are ultimately guided towards our own interest we are not uh, we are not caring for the friend for his own sake we are caring for the friend as long as we are getting some benefit out of it and in that light he talks about the perfect form of friendship or the virtue friendship which is my thank also you, like you. it is thank you we have got your point that uh, it is a, a specialized study of uh, nicomachean ethics regarding uh, friendship and aristotle is trying to give both the realistic and the idealistic interpretation regarding friendship your first two classifications are realistic uh, associated yes, with the human life and the last one the third category that you are giving that is the idealistic aspect so aristotle uh, could not uh, just uh, uh, place the friendship in the realistic model of things he also thinking beyond that is idealistic this is what is your contention असर माई मेन कंटेंट असर माई मेन कंटेंट इज वी हैव गॉट इट थैंक यू सर आई कॉन्ट हियर यू सर नाउ दिस ओपन फॉर डिस्कशन वी हैव गॉट योर पॉइंट थैंक यू सर देर इज नो क्वेश्चन इन दैंक यू सर ओके then we can proceed to the next one uh, sir next uh, participant is uh, mr uh, chitaranjan tripathi uh, from kolinga university is a research scholar uh, he will uh, present a paper entitled professional burnout among primary teachers a study acha is kolinga university is in, is in kolinga or somewhere else <laughs> but where is he has he has he joined हेलो 
ऑप्शन दीजिए कहीं ना कहीं सुबुन ठीक से चित्र प्लीज चित्र नॉट ऑडिबल रिसेट योर मशीनरी हेलो हाँ चित्र आप हो यू आर नॉट ऑडिबल प्लीज अनम्यूट योर सब so give him uh, some time and okay. uh, pass on to the next one next one uh, next is miss priti swain uh, from bikrandev uh, autonomous college jaipur with the he the student of uh, pg second year uh, she will present a paper on theory of punishment is she present thank you sir uh, yes please start thank your you. paper namaskar to all and a very good afternoon to everyone respected all digni dignitaries present over here myself priti swain is second year from bikram de mas college jaipur thank you so much for giving this opportunity to me today i am going to present my paper on the topic of the theory of punishment the concept of punishment is easily used for pet animals because when a pet animal does not behave in trained ways at that time we punish them a david action must be prefer punishment but the punishment not only appropriate for animal but also it more applicable in human domain a animal action is a string action but a action of a human being not like this so a human being can choose what he prefer to do or not when one commit to do on preferable action then he must be punished theory theories only applicable action of a person that is voluntary for the implementation of prerequisite to basic thing that is freedom and autonomy if a action done by someone without freedom then if the outcome this action be negative that does not imply the agent is responsible for it because the interest of agent not consider a action with freedom means both the outcome of this action either positive and negative then agent is responsible of this just like freedom and autonomy is also have a equal equal importance for the implementation of punishment if you does not provide autonomy for a agent then we can't consider action of the agent that produce either positive or negative results so it clear that the punishment is apply for that action which produce some negative results but this action can be avoid avoid but still we can't we have three principle theory of punishment namely first is retributive theory of punishment second is reformative theory of punishment third is deterrent theory of punishment and in later stages we add another theory of punishment that is capital theory of punishment let us discuss one by one first is retributive theory of punishment retributive theories of punishment advocate that punishment for a david action was determined by the consideration of degrees of crime this theory of punishment is in form of trick for trick eyes for an eyes hand for an hand and so on it implies that to repay the deserving results what one should deserve for his own unlawful activity but it does not mean that if anybody kill someone then we kill him it completely based on individual perspectives because when when one commit a wrong action then he or she is solely responsible for that action second is reformative theory of punishment reformative theory is a punishment advocated that a criminal not a intrinsically criminal but times one became criminal but times one became criminal because of some external forces some situation make them criminal so the nature of punishment is reform native of good qualities within a criminal if a person doing something deviant action because of this inflicts on some wrong persons that mean that means good qualities does not instinct within themselves there is a chance he can make himself good personality because of reformative attitude of punishment this kind of punishment not only punished a wrong doer but it also try to make a person who is complete how can he became good as we know that if a child commit any kind of wrong action we not only punish but only provide a platform in the form of punishment in which he have developed 
is nobility. This kind of punishment is more applicable in case of a baby criminal because when a child commit any wrong action, then he admit them child rehabilitation center. Third is deterrent theory of punishment. Deterrent theory of punishment is implemented as an ideal of punishment which is mark, uh, mark for others, those who are thinking about crime. The kind of pun the ki this kind of punishment set an example in society because of which other never commit any kind of unsocial activities. The nature of this kind of punishment not only punish a vice person but also provide justice to the victim and it also indi indicated possibilities of criminal activities from society. On the basis of punishment. Mm -hmm. On the basis of punishment, no doubt through punishment, a small criminal became more dangerous person in future. But there is a chance through the punishment, maybe one can one can detach himself from unsocial or criminal activities for all days. Deterrent theory of punishment work as a prevention against crime because the aim of it to stop the future crime in society by the light of previous crime which had a ideal punishment. On that way, if we provide a punishment to wrongdoer and our to good doer, then if anybody think about any kind of wrong activity, then at least once he think which type of punishment is given to the wrongdoer. So the aim of punishment not only justice victim, but also tries to manipulate it at eradicate crime. And Hello, uh, Piti, you, you have across your time now just tell us that which form of punishment do you accept and another thing whether uh, capital punishment that you have referred to belongs to uh, retributive theory or to the deterrent theory of punishment these two questions will help us thank you aha <laughs> priti Thank you, sir. Mm, Which theory of punishment you accept? Uh, sir, I accept reformative theories of punishment. Why? Sir, Johnny Jodi crime Korichi Tahale Taku Mane. No, no, don't, don't you think that the aim of punishment is both uh, all these three forms of punishment are they are in the aim of punishment. It is deterrent, it is reformative as well as it is retributive because unless retributive is accepted then law, the justice cannot be delivered to the person who, uh, who has suffered. And similarly, deterrent means it can be shown as a, a piece of example for others. Uh, and the reformative side is also important, supported by the criminal sociologist, psychologist, and anthropologist. So in, uh, punishment, theories of punishment is taken together. We cannot isolate these things. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. We can uh, wait for some more questions. Kichi question or chiki chat box, Dr. Patra? Nice, sir. So we can proceed to the next thing. She has very nicely presented. Thank you, sir. Hello, Mr. Titanian Tripadi. Hello, Mr. T Mr. Chitanjan Tripathi, Research Scholar. Research Scholar, Chitanjan yes. Tripathi. Chitanjan is okay. back now. His network oh, okay, is... Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay, okay. okay. All, all the respected members and dear colleagues, thanks to give me the opportunity to that part in the valuable discussion. Professional burnout among primary school teachers Mr. Chitranjan Tripathi, research scholar, calling university. Where is calling university? 
स्टूडेंट सिग्निफिकेंटली इनक्रीज the quality of education teachers are currently dealing with the several issue that are causing of this decline in the quality of education professional burnout is a big issue among primary school teachers professional burnout is characterized by accumulation of negative emotion and evidence of marks mal adjustment mal adjustment in the school environment factors such as infinity in pay distribution and severe workload of teachers are responsible for the lack of interest towards their profession burnout teachers have been de demonstrated to be less devoted and enthusiastic about their work excessive and uh, sustained strains can lead to burnout which is a condition of emotional mental and physical exhaustion it occurs when a teacher is overworked and unable to keep you keep up with professional demands teachers begin to lose interest in or motivation for their jobs as the stress increase burnout also demoralizes teachers energy and lowers their output leaving them feeling power powerless despondent clinical and angry burnout has negative influence on a person's family work and social life as well as on their health education is that which makes them. there have been a number of studies on teachers burnout the study conducted by akuja and kaya in 2014 revealed that burnout can have several deleterious effect on the physical psychological social and occupational functioning of primary school teachers studied conducted by to 2019 conducted that professional burnout to leads to reduction in job satisfaction loss of self esteem and despondent with the teachers job accomplishments another study by the chakravarti and singh in 2020 on primary school teachers of india found that burnout cause low worker morale impaired work performance and reduced productivity teaching is regarded as one of the most honorable profession teachers helps students create their futures in the classroom by providing the greatest possible education they are regarded as the most essential resources for improving educational quality primary education is of fundamental importance to the education of a student and the teachers at this stage have great responsibility to prepare the student for their future this burnout stress syndrome affect the work output of the teachers both quantitative both quantitatively and qualitatively it reduces the teachers ability to produce high quality work 
burnout is caused by a difficult modern lifestyle job stress discrimination and destination income disparity and social sum there is a close relationship between job stress and burnout therefore it is the need of the time to investigate how professional stress is related to primary school teachers this problem is very acute in the state of odisha the present study aims to understand the hello level hello of mr tripathi mr tripathi you have you have uh, uh, the consumed your time i should say that you just give us only in single line uh, to what is the futuristic alternative of uh, checking this uh, burnout we have got your point very nicely that, uh, that we need uh, not go to the statistics that's statistical evidence just give us any futuristic in one or two sentences because we are constrained of times thank you there is it is the need of the time to investigate how professional stress is related to private school teachers this problem is very acute in the state of odisha the present study aims to understand to level of burnout among primary school teachers and to suggest some possible measure to free them from burnout to suggest a trick tracks reduce the level of a professional burnout among the primary school teachers thank you yes, ndd uh, we can uh, proceed to the next one uh, next uh, speaker is um, mr uh, nursingh senapati uh, from vikrandev autonomous college pg second year students uh, sorry pg first year students uh, he will uh, present a paper on environmental ethics namaskar sir good afternoon everyone respect teachers and respect to opa members and my dear friends Here I am going to present the paper, which is entitled on environmental ethics. The word environment may be used in two senses. One is a winter sense, another is narrow sense. In winter sense, it means surrounding or uh, circumstances which includes the social and the moral surrounding. In this sense, environmental ethics include almost an uh, ethics, almost all. systems of moral principle and rules of conduct but in narrow sense environmental means non human nature includes plant and animals ethics the world ethics is derived from the greek words ethics which means custom usages and habits ethics is also known as moral philosophy the word moral is derived from the latin word mora mors which also mean customs or habits therefore ethics means sense of customs or habit of man it is sense of the habit conduct of man environmental ethics refers to the moral relation between human beings and their natural environment more specifically it refers to the value the mankind place in practicing environmental ethics mean ethics of the environment that means ethics is study of the man by the man for the man hence it is the non human world and the natural surrounding it is uh, with the moral uh, relation the hold between man and nature the bring environmental uses like the pollution re- resulting from the mind mindless uh, industrialization depletion of ozone layer green house effect global uh, warming uh, loss of uh, biodiversity and uh, employment of uh, depression population and uh, explosion etc environmental ethics uh, evaluates nature and jobs the duty of man towards uh, it for the question is you why does environmental need care and uh, consideration from us this question can be answered mainly on three grounds uh, first uh, anthropocentric ground uh, and second biocentric ground and third ecocentric ground anthropocentric ground the view holds that all the natural neros and uh, Uh, means of human use the natural ecosystem serves and the uh, instrument of a human welfare it, it is not value expect the value of mankind natural should be prepared uh, because the present of a future generation will live a healthy life on this earth it is for human values uh, and uh, human rights 
it evolves a nature on the ground that the basic needs and men like food clothes and shelter etc aristotle regards nature and heredity in which the function of the less relation and hence the perfect beings is to serve the more relation and the more perfect it is a political books he writers plant exit exist for the snake of animal and animals and bread of beasts for the snake of man second deep ecology and soil ecology american ecologist aldous uh, levert scans that uh, there is an uh, arranged niche for a new ethics that uh, establishes an uh, integral relationship between humans and the ecological system land animals and plants second then Bio, biocentric ground biocentric is an uh, alternative word view judging to the anthropocentrism view points look of ethical of uh, both human beings and environment in environmentism mm, the second true it is uh, against that the natural ecosystem simply does not exist to be used by the humans they are not just they are a server and a means and achieve human ends last the second echo ecocentric ground the ecocentric ground ecocentrism is the view advocated by aldo lepodo in his eg the land ethics he says the ecocentric ecosystem has its one history and uh, its one transitory in into future he explained to the ecosystem and the great nature it is not dead machine for human uh, use human are not uh, super species with the right and manager uh, in control based uh, to nature ecocentrism is a holistic world view according to which not only the living beings but also who ecosystem as uh, more standarding principle of deep deep ecological movement the environmental has uh, its one intrinsic value and it is independent upon human relation human being have no rights reduce and uh, reasons and the diversity of ecosystem expert as salary from a vital needs that needs last conclusion all these three values proposition give rise to absolute and extreme views that they played to to solve any ethical issues question this is vital ethical that respect all life not just the sentient animal human can reasons they should realize that nature in intrinsically value valuable and uh, related to in a meaning manner this is all about my paper thank you so much thank you uh, lusinga uh, i have only a very little uh, question small question that uh, if uh, two things are mentioned uh, about this study of the environment uh, ecology and environmentalism which one we should accept as students of philosophy nursinga please answer could you get me bujhi parla nursinga ame ame philosophy ra darshan ra chhatra hisab re kon grahan kariba ecology as a science or environmentalism I consider uh, you know that is called in means ethics that uh, all right uh, all so right uh, no no problem you have presented it very nicely we should go for environmentalism as uh, philosophy uh, as practitioners of philosophy but we have to take the cue from the ecology as a science okay so ecology will provide us with the data and we will analyze it and then we will put forth whether something should be acceptable or should not be acceptable thank you thank you sir and uh, thank you next one is 
मिस ज्योति विश्वास फ्रॉम बालुगा डिग्री कॉलेज बालुगा सी विल प्रेजेंट पेपर ऑन द भगवत गीता एंड ह्यूमन लाइफ ज्योति विश्वास यस सर आम आई ऑडिबल सर यस सर तो असली नहीं शासी ना असली तो हाँ तो सार वो बांटी सकता है ओ हो अच्छा आम आई ऑडिबल सर हाँ यस 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 गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन दिस इज ज्योति यूजी फर्स्ट ईयर फिलोसफी ऑनर्स बालुआ कॉलेज बालुगा माय टॉपिक इज द भगवत गीता एंड ह्यूमन लाइफ बिफोर कमिंसमेंट ऑफ माय टॉक इज माय प्राइड प्रिविलेज टू ऑफर अ ग्रैटिट्यूड टू ऑल ओडिशा फिलोसफी एसोसिएशन फॉर गिविंग मी सच एन अपॉर्चुनिटी टू रिफ्लेक्ट माय व्यूज ऑन दिस टॉपिक ऑन दिस ओकेजन आई कन्वे माय रिगार्ड्स टू द एक्सटीम चेयरपर्सन्स एंड अदर प्रोफेसर्स एंड माय डियर को पार्टिसिपेंट्स कनेक्टेड विद दिस वर्चुअल प्रोग्राम my motive of presenting paper on this topic specially is to make everyone aware of our culture which is dedicatedly meant for the whole mankind let me start towards the end of the rig veda there is a great discovery such as manur bhava janaya daivam janam the vedas give instruction to man first to become a mental being and then generate the divine being within in other words it is instructed to man to transform from the state of the individuality to the collectivity as to work together speak together think together have the same aspiration and realize together and so on the bhagavad gita is a treatise of man making and an ethical paradigm of humanity the gita is a scripture which tries to integrate the personality of the individual and make him capable of facing dynamically dynamically all his challenges in life in the bhagavad gita the man making science of the upanishad is brought out of the forest to serve us where we are suffering in the marketplace in the slum huts in the drawing rooms in the commune and at the barricades human mind is never at peace there is always an inspection of emotion and desires human desires are unlimited animals become satisfied after getting desired food humans need more and more and get trapped by his own passionate desires desire one must act one must one should know the skill of doing action through proper regulation of desires it is said in bhagavad gita that one should know the skill of performing action that knowledge is yoga therefore the bhagavad gita is called as a yoga shastra not a dharma shastra man easily get distracted by the temporary emotion and feelings which create an attachment with the things or the person around us it leads to the habitual disappointment through which we are forced to accept the unreal fact that we are good for nothing everyone has an empowerment to make anything possible but they are ignorant of their own inner power they can manifest what they want our subconscious mind has power of doing anything or making everything real which is thought by us we just need to train it in a proper way through meditation we need to have control over our emotion and attachment by keeping our mind at peace when arjuna was reluctant to fight against his own brothers the last shri krishna taught him the path of the righteousness this lesson not only inspired arjuna but also the whole mankind my objective in this paper is to submit how the bhagavad gita inspired us to walk on the path of the righteousness in our life and becomes a foundational source of inspiration for human life the biggest fear that an individual can possess is the fear of death la shri krishna states that when a man removes the fear of death from his life he can get numerous ways to live a stress free life in it la shri krishna states that our body is mortal while the soul is immortal it means our body can be killed but not our soul to understand it well he has given an example of clothes he states that when the clothes get torn they get replaced with the new one similarly when a person dies his soul enters a new body replacing the old one so one should neither fear the death nor grieve for the death death is the natural com- consequence of bodily decomposition human identity is not his own body rather the pure consciousness man is atman in his essence who never dies out of all the weaknesses that a human being can possess the anger is very detrimental to the self and others when man gets angry he tends to lose his temper he loses his discriminative wisdom he cannot distinguish between right and wrong himself after anger and fear if anything that uh, possesses a threat to an individual that is doubt when an individual doubts his own caliber he cannot achieve success thus we must never doubt our caliber if an individual does not keep control over his activities he tends to get distracted due to this he has to undergo distress depression and disappointment however if an individual takes time out of some time and meditates he will get many ways to solve his problems and also control his mind when an individual becomes selfish it becomes difficult for him to face the reality 
due to this selfishness he cannot see situations with a clear view and can end up damaging himself when something bad occurs we get worried about it or about the future occurrences which references to this uh narshi krishna states that what has happened has happened for good what is happening is happening for good and what will happen will happen for <coughs> thank you thank you we, we shall stop here uh, you have presented the gita's version and its relevance to the human life very nicely thank you uh, if there is any question on this so uh, no sir no no uh, we can uh, proceed to the next one uh, okay sir Uh, the next uh, presenter is uh, Satyabrata Das uh, from Utkal University, Bani Bihar. He is a research scholar. Uh, he will present a paper, ethical and legal issue related to proposed surrogacy. Okay. Sir, not Satyabrata Das, but Satyabrata Day, sir. Satyabrata Day. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, Mr. Day, present your paper. the end i am changed my topic name critical analysis on proposed surrogacy regulation bill 2019 critical analysis on proposed surrogacy regulation i mailed it uh, op and ramo sir but maybe some technical error they are not respond me uh, but my topic name is critical analysis on proposed surrogacy regulation bill 2019 uh, respected chair person respected chair person sir on this sir and uh, present uh, here many professor and teachers and my friends uh, uh, today my topic is critical analysis on proposed surrogacy regulation bill 2019 first i am going to read my abstract advancement in reproductive technology has blessed infertile couple with their own babies with this with the surrogacy on, uh, on one hand this is helpful on other hand this has potential for exploitation of all three surrogate mother surrogate baby and infertile couple government of india has taken many initiatives to control this and to regulate the art killing limit recently surrogacy regulation bill 2019 has been passed from lok sabha and soon it will become law this is major step towards ending commercial surrogacy in india this talk uh, this step does not seem to end all the issues related to surrogacy and need critical evolution making commercial surrogacy illegal has the potential to perpetuate illegal practices making surrogate even more vulnerable putting ban over this is not the solution that the commercial surrogacy has to be regulated i am going to uh, discuss what is called surrogacy when a couple uh, who are unable to give birth to a child take the help of another woman and that woman carries and gives birth to the baby of that couple then it is deemed as terminal surrogacy so surrogacy is two types uh, one is traditional surrogacy and another is gestational surrogacy in traditional surrogacy the surrogate mother is also the biological mother of the child as uh, as uh, and she is impregnated with the sperm of the intended father in gestational surrogacy the surrogate mother does not share any genetic connection with the fetus and she is impregnated with the embryo through in vitro fertilization there are also two types of surrogacy called commercial surrogacy and uh, uh, altruistic surrogacy the term commercial surrogacy is used when the surrogate is given compensation higher than the medical compensation and other reasonable expenses when surrogate mother helps the couple out of love and compensation and the monetary compensation is not more than medical comp uh, compensation then it is called altruistic surrogacy now no, i am going to sir empty ekak kotha ami sunthile kishan purbhu now i am going to discuss uh, what is the my analysis on uh, surrogacy regulation bill 2019 as per surrogacy regulation bill 2019 commercial surrogacy is banned in india and only altruistic or non commercial surrogacy is allowed that through by close relatives although close relatives is not defined here and this is also a shortcoming of bill and it need to address this bill is framed such that to prevent exploitation of surrogate mother and to safeguard the rights of surrogate child so that nobody can force her to carry a pregnancy in the greed of money but the, but is it the situation in reality are this measure are enough to prevent exploitation of female body is it really working for infertile couple the altruistic concept of carrying a baby for someone else is allowed in the bill as long as there was no exchange of money beyond the medical bill in addition this altruistic form of surrogacy can only be done with the help of close relatives as per the bill this close relatives should be married and must have her own child it sounds good but practical it will almost impossible for an infertile couple to find such close relatives to carry their pregnancy uh, and uh, that too for no money in today's scenario people do not have extended families 
they usually have on uh, nuclear family so finding such close relatives to fulfill the criteria for surrogacy may be difficult nowadays women are carriers oriented uh, career oriented and usually they themselves find it difficult to carry pregnancy for them uh, themselves then how such close can relative uh, can spare time to help their needy relatives even if they wanted to do so and that too without compensation for their wages uh, wages loss how many infertile couple will be able to find appropriate surrogate and can ask for such favor even if a close relative is ready to help uh, she may be restrained by the husband or family members from doing so and it may lead to uh, friction within family here also there are chance that close relative uh, female could be forced by female members for helping infertile couple against her own wish as infertile couple do not have other option so they may be forced her is it not exploitation of their property she may become surrogate against her wish just to prevent uh, coercion is in family even if both the parties are ready even there are a few issue with close relatives like uh, secrecy is not maintained in such situation and everyone in relation uh, relation knows about surrogacy this uh, could be problem in handling of the resulting child a child is in continuous contact with her resting mother uh, uh, and this can please, complicate please their finish uh, in one uh, line in one sentence try to finish what you want to say on this uh, i am going to my conclusion part when we make something illegal people find other way to do so and surrogacy make the place under cover and we cannot stop them such infertile couple may find someone in need of money and they may get their work done she will become surrogate but will be deprived of insurance and will put her life so danger so this is clear that a woman can be exploited in even altruistic surrogacy it would be wise not to ban commercial surrogacy but to make strict law and regulate it when this will become a law that a woman cannot become surrogate more than once then this would be the injustice not to compensate her daily wages loss and her effort mandatory thank you sir that's all but one thing uh, that remains unanswered for all of us that when a law is implemented it is not properly promulgated because if you stop commercial surrogacy then it will take place through some other means and that is what is happening in india and uh, therefore india is now taken as the surrogate uh, surrogacy capital of the world because uh, people all over the world come over here to uh, uh, find that whether a womb is uh, available on rent okay so commercial thing even if debarred in the law of 2019 it is still prevalent you try to uh, analyze that law and the loopholes that is found in that law thank you i think there is no other question on it we can proceed on similar paper is there uh, uh, afterwards okay thank you thank you sir uh, <clears throat> thank you uh, next uh, speaker is mr mohima sagar malik from gangadhar meher uh, university sambalpur he is a research scholar he will present a paper on peter singer's concept of one world a critical study mohima sagar are you present hello mohima sagar is present or not no no next uh, mona lisa behra from vikram dev autonomous college mona lisa are you present yes sir yes on what you she will speak i think she theory of punishment, punishment. Uh, uh, hello mona lisa we have already discussed uh, a great deal on mona uh, on uh, theories of punishment by your um, classmate so you if you have something new to say you please uh, tell us okay please carry on punishment as is normally understood is an act of inflicting pain or imposing penalty or roughly treating someone who has committed an offense or crime that is generally not excusable under state laws it may also be defined as something that is imposed or inflicted by an authority on an offender is accordance with the existing state laws bringing about some injury or harm or insult to offender there are three principal theories of punishment they are preventive theory reformative theory and 
retributive theory first one is preventive theory preventive theory puts forth that the object of punishment inflicted upon a सो यू हैव टू कीप इट इन माइंड बिकॉज द रेट्रीब्यूशन और डिटरेंट बोथ विल फेल इफ ओनली रिफॉर्मेशन विल बी द एम ऑफ पनिशमेंट ओके सो यू ब्रूड ओवर दिस एंड द थैंक यू वेरी मच वी कैन प्रोसीड टू द नेक्स्ट पेपर थैंक यू सर थैंक यू नेक्स्ट स्पीकर इज डॉक्टर कल्याण सडंगी फ्रॉम कमला नेहरू वुमेंस कॉलेज भुवनेश्वर uh he uh, she will present a paper on altruistic uh, surrogacy issue and uh, implications thank you uh, hello yes. am i am uh, i audible to all of you yes you are quite audible uh, proceed on madam okay okay sir okay so thank you uh, lakshman patra esteemed uh, chairperson of this session and my respected teachers present in this meeting and my dear fellow participants Uh, the title of my presentation is sur altruistic surrogacy issues and implications so it is already discussed so here i am just uh, trying to uh, raise the toast so that we can ponder over this issue for its clarity and implementation so here before going to present it i am just quoting tasleema nasrin the writer who uh, commented upon just a day after priyanka chopra and nick jonas announced their first child by by surrogacy and she said that it is a narcissistic trait of rich people calling surrogate kids as ready made babies so with this let me begin the very word surrogacy it derives from the root word surrogates and you know surrogates means substitute um, uh, or you can say that uh, we just put in in another place and we know it is already discussed that there are different types of surrogacy traditional surrogacy and gestational surrogacy and you all know our scriptures are full of traditional surrogacy i am not going to discuss that in case of gestational surrogacy uh, the uh, you can say the surrogate mother because in this process the entire process there are two parties are involved one is the surrogate mother who carries the baby and delivers the baby for some couple or for some other person and uh, the other party is involved in this process is the intended parents who are also called as the commissioning parents and you know in case of gestational surrogacy the surrogate mother she is not only biologically or genetically uh, connected with the child or with the baby she you can say she is uh, the oh, she is only the carrier of the baby uh, it is possible through advanced technology i mean you can say through ib ivf the uh, either by donors or by the intended parents the zygote is formed and then it is placed in the womb of the surrogate therefore as rightly uh, ranjit sir just pointed out that it is also called as the womb on red so here i can uh, raise a question that is how far it is ethically justified because when we talk about organ donation we just uh, uh, blame in any form of donation but if donation is all ethical unethical so how can we justify the lending of the or the renting the womb how we can justify it anyway let's move on uh, again this gestational surrogacy is of two types commercial and altruistic there are much and much debate controversies complications are involved in case of commercial surrogacy Uh, you know but uh, indian particularly as sir again pointed out that it becomes a capital uh, tourist capital india gradually become because many countries all over the world they completely banned only in some countries some parts of the russia ukraine california india they are the hubs of this commercial practice of surrogacy 
but in 2005 icmr indian council of medical research they issued guidelines and in a way you can say that they legalized the practice of the Uh, commercial surrogacy but when we talk about commercial surrogacy no doubt the surrogate mother she is exploited her body is exploited only for money or for compensation she is used abused you can say so it is uh, a, it is uh, it has both its uh, uh, you can say positive contributions as well as negative contributions i am not going into discuss that if there will be discussion i will clarify you more so coming to the altruistic surrogacy bill which is passed in the year uh, regulation bill which is passed in the year 2020 that completely banned commercial surrogacy in india and allows only altruistic surrogacy so by that you know there are many people who are excluded you can talk the you can take the example of lgbt people you can take the example of foreign nationals they are completely excluded from this practice and it it involves no monetary compensation because in commercial uh, in surrogacy practice monetary compensation was there but here in case of altruistic surrogacy there is no involvement of any monetary compensation to the surrogate mother Uh, only other than the medical expenses or you can say the insurance coverages during the pregnancy but at the same time it it also because if we analyze the entire bill as it is pointed out by the previous presenter i am also supporting that one the the very first line of that bill tells us that the surrogate mother should be a close relative one so this close relative with the bracket this close relative one is really very very ambiguous one because we all are living in the age of nuclear family uh, and in the nuclear family to find out really to find out uh, to, uh, to be a surrogate mother out of altruistic approach that becomes a really a difficult task if we will see the uh, world uh, health Dr. organization Sarangi, two more minutes two okay. more minutes please okay sir if we see the uh, the um, world health organization's recent report the report tells us that 48 million couple are childless so they need to be their problem need to be addressed i think and because again uh, because of too much pressure it may be a possibility that there will be the underground surrogacy practice may be there so uh, again uh, the dignity of the woman when we say that she is out of her concern out of her care she is trying to gift a baby to the childless couple that out of her care and compensation that again need to be uh, addressed very carefully we have to see that whether the surrogate mother she is forced or Uh, she is completely free to take the decision so my point of submission before the audience is that uh, this needs to be there are more and more gray, gray areas rather than black and white areas so it need to be addressed from uh, a social activist point of view from medical point of view from the surrogate mother point of view and from the child uh, who born out of the surrogacy pro- process because there are different case laws as there baby manji baby m different cases as there so again from the intended couples point of view it has to be addressed so that we can have a better if at all there are better options just like adoption if at all there are better options are there that need to be encouraged thank you thank you all namaskar to all of you thank you dr sarangi you have presented uh, it very uh, nicely but as philosophers uh, if we go on analyzing this concept of surrogacy we will find that from the uh, either from the deontological point of view or from the consequentialist point of view surrogacy is not acceptable so the, our slogan should be don't surrogate but adopt so the, sure. in that way the adoption becomes a practice Uh, under uh, law and there are uh, if if the uh, laws are made in a very uh, favorable manner more and more people will adopt rather than surrogate thank you uh, sorry a question uh, from kyom naran rao sir to colleen madam um, that uh, the surrogate mother may be <coughs> married or unmarried 
if the woman is unmarried then question may arise about her virginity whether she will still called a virgin hello uh, so yeah, i think answer, i madam. think no. i yeah. think the question this is not uh, pertinent here the question because if we we have to analyze the intention of the person then only we can pass such type of comments because if because you see i have already pointed out that she is whether she is forced she is compelled by her husband by her uh, father, by her family members that need to be explored that need to be analyzed properly that has to be traced out properly so uh, i think no, no, uh, madam, madam you see the thing is uh, dr think... rao's point is valid so far as the muslim law is concerned but in christian law or in our hindu law yes, the, yes. your point this of view can be maintained because... but muslim law strongly denounces this thing no okay. no sir i just uh, yeah. i am just trying to say that i am not talking about any religious perspective i am just talking about the analyzing trying to analyze the concept but i my only submission is that more law should be law should be very clear so that there should be st still that there is no international law is formed for this process because it involves internal procedure as well as public policy so more deb debate more discussions is yet to be done on this topic i just my concern is whether in this process whether we can say the virginity is lost or whether it is there so that is my concern that so, will be linguistic well, uh, question uh, that will be linguistic question <laughs> whether one uh, like, like like the one in which uh, the concept of third gender came in it is like sir, that sir sir okay sir thank you thank you sir thank you uh, so dr patra i think we should uh, resume at uh, 2:30 again for the few less uh, remaining papers no sir we will continue <laughs> we will continue <laughs> yes so I uh, think we, uh, because there is a. Uh, Ranjit sir, Ranjit sir, Ranjit sir. Ah, uh, sir, who are you? We may assemble again at two thirty hmm. to take up the rest of the papers because the meeting of the general body will be shifted to five pm. Okay, that will be yeah. better. Yeah. I think. Kinda, ah, that will be better. Uh, uh, uh yeah somewhere at lunch time today. <laughs> if we go on, I think <laughs> ah, okay. you see the. Okay, okay. Okay. So friends, so, we now disperse. Uh, uh, but but before that, I would uh, extend profuse thanks to Professor Ranjit Ghosh for ably managing this uh, um, session. But the session has not ended. It will continue uh, at two thirty, and we will continue till four when the validatory function will take place. And after the validatory, uh, after the validatory, uh, we will hold the general body meeting at five pm. Thank you very much. Let us break and uh, join again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.